morning. Good to see you all again. This is your old pal, Superintendent Al here at FBCS Construction. No helmet today. Just uh, we're in the office today, unless we get called out to uh, as the uh, concrete folks are here to start pouring the foundation for this large building. We're glad that you're here. We're here to build our lives on the foundation of Christ. His love, right? That was our first foundation. The second foundation is the foundation of forgiveness. And so today we're going to be looking at the foundation of work. If you have your Bibles or your electronic devices, I got mine today. So you can turn to um, Matthew chapter 26. It will be in verses 36 through 46. You have your nice app there, you can do so, which is awesome. I like to do that with mine. So I can turn to it. You, I, I, uh, <clears throat> so we're gonna you can do that or you can use your own. Also have your student guide with you. Today's foundation three, foundation work. And so we're gonna find out how God has uh, given us work. Let's uh, pray together and we'll walk through today's lesson, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we can be together today to learn from your word and to understand the foundations that we need to live on, which is you. And out of you being the cornerstone, our foundation of love, our foundation of forgiveness, our foundation of worth, as we're learning today, Lord, we're... Um, we're thankful that you are a solid rock that we can build our lives upon. And we ask today as we learn about you in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, the Mount of Olives, where you were praying with your disciples on the night before you were betrayed, Lord, that we can find out how much we are worth by your love for us and for the Father. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So let me call attention to our, uh, um, our poster here today for our Is this no greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends? What an awesome thing, John 15, 13, that Jesus choose, chose to die for me and for you. And so that's a wonderful thing that how Jesus comes and lays down his life for us so that we might have the forgiveness of our sins. Say that with me together, why don't we? No one has greater love than this to lay down his life on his friend. What an awesome thing to think about. What an awesome thing to understand. And so um, Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for us. So I ask you to reflect on that and think about this. If Jesus makes the ultimate sacrifice for us, what will we sacrifice in order to spend more time with him? Maybe it's less time on social media. Maybe it's less time playing video games or chatting with our friends. Because Jesus is worthy of our praise, worthy of our life, worthy of our time. And so we should be uh, thinking about what we would sacrifice in order to spend time with Jesus as he sacrificed his life for us. In 2016, the Environmental Protection Agency, which is referred to as EPA, said or estimated the worth of a human being as about $10 million. So I ask you, what is your reaction to that statement? Is that accurate? Are we, is there a monetary value that you can put on us? We're exactly $10 million? Are we priceless? I don't know, because you see in the Bible and and so I want to say this, in the Bible, it has a different definition of what we're worth. Um, because Jesus came to die for us. So we probably worth much more than $10 million. How do you define it? Well, Merriam-Webster Dictionary has a monetary value or the value of something measured by its qualities or by the esteem in which it is held. That's the way the world calls it. But I... But I tell you, the VBS poster, you know, that's here, which we just read aloud, that no greater love than this, someone 
that he laid down his life for his friends, that tells me that the work is priceless. So I just ask us that we would think about this. Jesus' love for us gives us worth. His mercy, his grace towards us gives us worth. We are made in his image, which gives us dignity, not only to him, but to one another. And so this means that he's still working in us also. And so we are always a work in progress, as our verse reminds us. For the week, it says, Philippians 1, 6, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus, meaning that day when he, re he returns, or the day that we go home to be with him. God will complete it. And so let's pray, shall we, uh, for our lesson. Father, we pray for our lesson now as we prayed earlier to open up this lesson. We ask that you would um, move in our hearts with your spirit, get down deep in us, Lord, and open up those areas that need to be open, comfort those areas that need comfort or hurting that need comfort, correct those areas that are wrong, um, and encourage those areas that need help and challenge those areas that need to be challenged. We ask the same as we read your word from Matthew 26. Amen. So we are excited to see this, and we're looking forward to this today. So I hope that you uh, have this. So let's um, turn to your leader book at page 15. And so we're going to look at this list. This I want to look at the parts of the crane here. You can see it there. Uh, as you see the page, it's all got the the lettering and identification on there. And so they're identifying the uh, base right at the bottom. And then the mast, which is the, just like a ship, it's the center column that goes up, the way the crane goes up and down and pivots on. Uh, we also see the jib, which runs out the arm there on the front there. We see the operator's cab, that's where the crane operator sits. The machine arm, which is on a, a trolley, it's like a, um, a chain fall lift. So it has a, a motor on the top there and it can lift several tons of weight and the cables go back and forth. And the, the, the crane is weighted in the back and with those cables, they pull up tons and tons of, of materials from the ground, steel, and sometimes even concrete on, on bed and uh, uh, pallets of, uh, of uh, aluminum tubs that hold the concrete in there. So it's pretty amazing to see that. And the sewing unit at the top uses the, 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 the part where the, the pulleys are for the cables as they go up and down and move the crane back and forth. What an um, interesting thing. And so uh, I want us to turn over to page 16 and let's answer these questions, shall we? So we were looking at firm foundation, right? There's, there's many foundations that we can build our life on in this world, but there is only one for certain firm foundation. That's Jesus Christ. So let's take a look. Uh, why don't uh, huge tower cranes topple over, especially since they have no support wires? Uh, that's a pretty good question, but we know from the mass, right, as it tells us there, the tower crane is anchored into a large concrete pad at the bottom, which usually measures 30 feet by 30 feet by four feet and weighs 400,000 pounds with a large anchor bolts embedded deep into the pad. So that's a lot of weight holding down the crane so that it doesn't topple over. Now, when you, you see that, Let's take a look at the questions it's asking us based on those cranes. Number one, the closer the load is positioned to the mast, the more weight that the crane can lift safely. Number two, the typical tower crane has a maximum unspotted height of 500 feet. Number three, this is true or false now, as you can read there. The maximum load a typical tower crane can lift is 39,690 pounds, but the load cannot be at the end of the jib, meaning the long arm. Number four, to rise to its maximum height, the crane grows itself one mass section at a time. 
So as you look at those questions, let me just go on to say about that. So as the, they build it to a certain height, the crane, and then there comes a time when they'll need to add to it. Sometimes as the building goes higher, they'll add another section of the mass, mass to the crane so it'll go a little higher to lift things to other levels of the building. So let's take a look at our answers. Number one, the closer the load is positioned to the mass, the more height the crane can, safe, can lift safely. And that is true. That is true. Number two, a typical crane has a maximum unsupported height of 500 feet. Number two, that is false. It's actually 265 feet. Number three, the maximum load a typical crane can lift is 39,690 feet, feet per pounds. But the load cannot go to the edge of the jib, right? That's the long arm. And that is true also. Number four, to, ri to rise to its maximum height, the crane grows itself one mass section at a time. And that is true. Awesome. So great job on that. Let's get ready to build. Uh, as we saw our session three poster, which was what we talked about, no greater love than this, that a man, that a friend lay down his, that a man lay down his life for his friend. On 15th of the what a beautiful thing. I want us to call attention to that because Jesus cho chose to die for us. Let's um, take a look at that and then let's recite that together, shall we? No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 5. I wanted us to look at that again and reiterate that and to see that together. Because no one does. So we want to look at these cranes. They are invaluable to construction process of large buildings and invaluable to Jesus, we are because he considered us valued and of great worth because he chose to die, cool down on our behalf on the cross for us. Jesus is the one who gives us one. So we're going to build together. We're going to build the foundation of worth and the fact that Jesus chose to die for us on the cross gives us that worth. So let's turn over our, our Bibles to Matthew chapter shall we? And we're going to put out that Jesus is soon approaching his death on the cross. They had just finished up the Lord's Supper in the uh, upper room. And so they're out in the garden praying. And he is prepared to be obedient to follow his father's purpose of dying. So let's look at 36 through 38, shall we? See what Matthew has for us today. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take it, take and eat it. This is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you. For this is my, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it with you in my father's kingdom. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Peter said to them, Tonight, tonight, then, sorry, but Jesus said to them, Tonight all of you will fall away because of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter told him, even if everyone falls away because of you, I will never fall away. I truly tell you, Jesus said, tonight before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Even if I have to die with you, Peter told him, I will never deny you. All the disciples said the same thing. Then Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane, and he told his disciples, sit here, while I go over and pray, taking along Peter and two, two sons of Zebedee, which are James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. 
<clears throat> so that's where Jesus is in the garden, right before he's about to die, right before he's about to be betrayed by Jesus. And so we see that, that all this has taken place. They have eaten the meal together. They're going out there. They sang a hymn together. They're in the place of the garden. There's a Mount of Olives there. There's an olive grove. And they often went there to, um, to pray and to seek the Lord. And uh, just relax and rest. There was a place of uh, replenishment. And so we, he knows this is going to happen. He realizes the time has come. His mission is to be fulfilled, right? So Jesus goes to that garden. They need it for a retreat to find out, you know, to pour out his heart to God, as often we should do when we go to pray, by ourselves, away from our electronic devices, so that we can spend time alone with the Lord. So let me look. Let's look at um, our, our books once again. Our guides, uh, page seventeen. Let's look at this and let's fill this out, okay? And look at our schedule, and then we'll come back in a moment after we take a break, and then um, we'll uh, take a look at this, and then we'll we'll walk through our schedules and see what what we have. All right. I'll see you back in a couple minutes. Okay, we're back. So uh, sorry about that. I had contractors here doing some painting, so. Yeah, you know, when you're the superintendent, you never know what's going to happen. Or all kinds of work. So I hope your schedules are uh, taking a look at. You know, and I know you all have a lot of things to do. A lot of people think that you're, because you're single and a, a teen that you don't really have things to do. But you do. I know, I know that you, do. you have a lot of things to do. And so list out your 168 hours a week, and then start with that and subtract. Uh, your goal is to account for all of your time. So we have an average of seven hours of sleep each night, and you would subtract 49 hours from 168 hours, right? So that gives us about 142 hours, I think. Let me check that just to be accurate, because you know, when you're in construction, you always want to be accurate. Because if your building is off, if you're, any of your forms or foundational things are off a 16th of an inch, it'll show up, just as we learned about that in the Tower of Pisa, right? The foundation is turning perpendicular, but this way, sorry. So let's see, 168 minus 49 equals 119. We have 119 hours where we are awake and doing activities. So from there, you've written out your hours. And so once you have accounted for your 168 hours, put it on a pie chart. So the, the amount of hours, you know, you can do, uh, here's my pen, here it is. So you can do it like this. Work, let's say that's um, 80 hours, or maybe it's a little bit more. Right, so we'll just do that and then say that, like mine here, it says work like this. And so it's work and do your, you know, your studies, school, you have to account for school. So anything that you do during the day and each week, you have to account for it. So that's what your time is. Do the pie graph here and you'll see um, what your time is. And so we want to uh, ask ourselves when we go through this, is how much time, how, where do we spend most of our time? I guess I should say how much time, but where do we spend most of our time? Work, study, school, what is it? Um, and then also ask us ourselves, how much time do we spend with God? Or with God, things such as attending church and praying and reading our Bibles, so on. If uh, <clears throat> common sense media tells us this, that the average team spends about nine hours a day online. Now, it could be up or it could be lower, I mean, down, but, uh, you know, where are you with that in your online time? You got to put that on there, too, because that's a, a deduction off of it. How much are you online? Are you on Twitter? You're on Facebook, Parler, Instagram, TikTok, what, whatever you're on. Um, how much time are you on there? And then uh, what would you cut back in order to have that time with Jesus? Have that time with God. So mark it on your calendar or schedule, what you would change. 
right? How much would you give back? Get a change so that you could get that more time alone with the Lord. <clears throat> so let's continue on, right? So we've changed our, our guide, so we want to look at uh, uh, prayer, right? Jesus is praying in the garden to the Father as he often did. He went off alone, he got by, by himself, and he prayed with the Lord. We talk with God, and we talk to God, and we listen, right? And I want us to take, think about this, too. As when we're alone with God, um, we should have his word with us. Because then we get to hear God speak to us through his word. And so what God is telling us through his word is most important. Even though what we say is important to God, it's most important for us to hear from God in his word so that we can understand his will, his good, pleasing, perfect will. Like how else will we know what we're worth if we don't know God's word? That teaches us and tells us that God will complete the work that is in us, right, until the day of Christ Jesus. But we're not alone, that God is going to be there working with us, like we are on the job site and working in the concrete and putting the rebar in and pouring the concrete in. And having the cranes bring the steel up and attaching them together. God is working in us through his spirit, using his word to teach us the morals and shape us. He's also using other Christians, their parents, and teachers. No matter if they, if they are believers in Christ or if they're not, God is still using all those people in your life to mold and shape you. And he's also put those people in your life so that you can help mold and shape them by sharing with them who Christ is and how much they are worth in Christ, just as you are. So we've cut back some time. We've listed that on our schedule so we can improve our schedule, right? <clears throat> God gives us wisdom and direction also from those times alone with him in prayer. Point, I want you to point out to that that Jesus didn't go alone. He went and took it, Peter, James, and John with him. And, and what do you think? Why do you think he took these three with him? Well, I think we can tell this. So all the disciples go. Some of them stop at the at the edge of the garden or a little ways into the garden. And then Jesus goes on to a little, little place further for privacy. And he takes Peter, James, and John with him. Those are the three folks that Jesus has spent the most time with. Not that he has not spent a lot of time with the disciples, but those were the inner circle of Jesus, his closest disciples. So that's why they took them. So um, <clears throat> when you look at these and you see the disciples, right, and those folks that are around you, we need those folks too, right? We need people to pray with us and pray for us, just as uh, we learned today from our admin that her... Um, her cousin, uh, Brenda Gaskin, uh, we're going to pray for her right now. She's having uh, naval surgery, so let's pray for her. Father, we thank you for Miss Brenda and that you would be with her and guide her. I pray that you would uh, walk with her through this surgery. She's uncertain about it. Lord, it's the first one she's ever had, and I pray that it will fix the issues that she has with her sinuses. So that uh, to your glory and for her good, we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, we need people to pray for us. We need people to take care of us. So I, I, we need friends to help us. But if we look at the disciples, what kind of support did they provide Jesus in this garden at this time? It doesn't mean they didn't before. We need other people in our lives to support us, to encourage us, to challenge us, to correct us, and to do life with us. We must do the same. We must stand with them, help them, encourage them, challenge them, comfort them, because God is using us in the lives of other folks. Let's wrestle with this. Jesus showed his humanity in the previous verses here. He experienced deep agony, and he was burdened. By the world's sin. Can't imagine that. God being weighed down by our sin. And he knew he would face the cross by crucifixion on the cross. I mean, he knew that he was going to see the cross and his crucifixion. And I'll tell you what, if you look it up and read about it, 
crucifixion is one of the most horrific ways to die. One of the most horrific ways to execute someone, to murder someone. It's horrible. So the Assyrians were the first ones to, to have it, and then the Romans took it from them and perfected it. That's what they did. They increased it. They, they made it even more uh, worse than it was, I guess. It was like, the, it was like taking an engine and, and uh, you have 500 horsepower and giving it 550. They took it to the next level. So Jesus died this horrible and crucial death on the cross. So we're going to wrestle with this. We look at 39 through 41. And it says this, going on a little further. He fell face down and prayed, my father, if it is possible that this cup pass for me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Verse 40, then he came to his disciples and found them sleeping, and he asked Peter, so why you couldn't stay awake with me for one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Um, we need to wrestle with this. We need to understand this. We need to take, you know, Jesus prayed to God as he faced death on the cross and asked if there was another way that he didn't have to die. Was there another way for me to do this? And again, it showed Jesus' humanity. As God's son, he came to earth. He knew this was his mission to die. He knew that he was going to die. This is what he grew up with his whole life, knowing he was going to die. He came, but as a human, he knew that he would face the agony in the flesh. As fully God and fully man, he knew in the flesh he would face the agony that is accompanied with sin. And he did that for us in our place. God's son came to earth. This was his mission. And so let's look at page 18 on our books, our guides here. And let's take a look at that and see um, his mission and review the facts about sleeping on page 18. So there's a truth, a little bit of truth about fact, uh, truth facts about sleeping. 35% of Americans get seven hours, don't get seven hours of sleep. Each oh my. On average, Americans get 6.8 hours of sleep each night. Around 20% of Americans report having a sleep disorder. The percentage of adults getting less than six hours of sleep each night has increased by 31% since 1985. That's a lot. I hope that you are guarding that for yourself, that you at least get seven hours of sleep each night. I know sometimes it's hard as a teenager. Um, you got so many things to do or, or activities in school and with the COVID going on and going to school maybe, and some of you are doing hybrid classes where you're there a couple of days at home a couple of days. It may uh, interfere or uh, upset a little bit your schedule. So I just pray that you would um, guard your time of sleep, that you would look get those hours as each night. Seven out of 10 college students report we don't get adequate sleep. Each year, sleep deprived of sleep deprivation costs the U.S. $411 billion. Wow, because they're, you know, maybe have a prescription to help them or do different things to help them meditate or buy CDs or use programs to, to help them sleep at night. Jesus asks his friends to stay awake, to be alert and pray. Instead, he comes back and the, the inner three, James, Peter, and John, uh, find them sleeping. Why do you think they could not stay awake? They could have been tired. They, you know, they, they could have eaten a lot of carbs. You know, all the bread that they ate at the last supper might have made them sleepy. You know, carbohydrates like pastas and things do make us sleepy because it's Kind of slow down a little bit our digestive system. And then ask ourselves at the end here. We could have been tired from the journey and the walking around or the days and events. Uh, you know, we could have been tired from uh, being at Bethany, you know, walking from Jericho up to Jerusalem. I mean, Jericho is the lowest spot on the earth, like 14, 19 feet below sea level, and then you have to walk up that plus another. 4,500 feet up to Jerusalem, so that's a pretty steep walk. Maybe they were tired from that. And then finally, what do you? Why do you think sleep is so important? We need sleep. 
our bodies need to be recharged. We need to spend time in bed, and that's the way our bodies. Our bodies will never overcome that sleep deprivation until we get to sleep. We must get to sleep. So, what do you do to stay awake then? Drink a Mountain Dew, or you're taking a test, or pulling a whole nighter to study for an exam, or write a paper, or drive for a long period of time. What do you do to stay awake? Power nap, or you take long nap with somebody who doesn't nap. You just maybe take an energy drink, a monster or something. My boys uh, had me do that one time for a, for a men's day. We went out and got something to eat and some video games to play, and they were like, oh, Dad, let's uh, let's get a monster. Let's try it on. I said, okay. So we did, and they were teenagers then. And uh, I did, and I was still up at 2 o'clock in the morning, and we drank those at lunchtime on Saturday. Sunday morning, I was still awake. And I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. So what do we do? And so um, let me ask you this. Why did Jesus ask Peter to stay awake and avoid temptation? You know, oftentimes, you know, when we're drowsy and sleepy, we can do things that we won't normally do, especially when we're sleep deprived. Or we don't think as clearly. We might choose to do something that we shouldn't do or wouldn't think about it. We weren't as sharp and alert. When Jesus says to pray to avoid temptation, right? Because that happens when we're sleepy. We can easily be tempted. There is an acronym called HALT. I learned years ago from Dr. Stanley, Charles Stanley. He said this, when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired of the times when you are tempted, then you are more likely susceptible to, to give in to temptation. So we need to be alert. We need to be prayed up. We need to be read up and word and prayed up with the Lord. So that we can avoid this temptation. We flee when we need to flee. <clears throat> when you're facing temptation, it will benefit us all to stay committed to God and pray, right? Jesus is being, um, I'm sure, being tempted here to, to not follow through with the cross. I'm sure that Satan is beating him up over the head and seeing inside, but he knows it's going to go. The only reason why Satan would ever try to tempt him because he's in the flesh. Because he did that when he was in the garden. I mean, not in the garden, but he was in the wilderness. It was the beginning of his ministry. So will it's resolve? Let's ask uh, this. Let's ask our questions. How do we resolve these issues? So let's look at uh, 42 through 46. And we'll read that. And it says, again, a second time he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. See, Jesus is is saying there differently than the second time. He went away and he prayed and he said, my father, if this cannot pass from me, as some, as some uh, versions say, unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came again and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. After leaving them, he went away again, praying a third time, saying the same thing once more, right? My father, if this cannot pass from me or cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. He prayed the same thing once more. And he came to the disciples and said, Are you still sleeping in rest? You see, the time is near. The Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's go. See, my betrayer is here. Talking about Judas coming towards him with the time of God. And so that what we see. We see that we have times that we should wait for God's answer to be revealed when we pray. But in the meantime, we must submit to God's sovereignty and his will for our lives. Keep doing what God has already called us to do as we're seeking the answers. Let's add, uh, what, what did Jesus know to be God's will for his time of prayer? He knew he was not just passing time. He wasn't just counting the minutes. Oh, let me get to the next thing. Right? He knew his time was near and he was about to be betrayed. He knew his time had come because he told us so, his disciples. Jesus, you know, Jesus resolved to totally submit to the will of the Father. So let's take a look at page 19 and look at these questions and think about submission, submitting to the will of the Father. Jesus ultimately submitted to the will of God because he loved and valued each of us, and he loved the Father. He resolved to move forward with what lie ahead for him. So here's a question. On a daily basis, 
To whom do you submit on a daily basis? Your parents, teachers, and school faculty, the police, church leaders, God, other. You see, we should be checking all of those on a daily basis. I mean, we may not interact with the police all the time or church leaders every day, but we are interacting with God, we're interacting with our parents interacting with our teachers. And we should do what they want us to do. If it's not immoral or criminal, if it's not against God's word, or if it's not criminal against uh, the laws of the state, then we should do it. But when it conflicts with God's law, then we are to follow God's law. But only. So how do we submit to the authorities in our life? Do we do what they ask us to do, what they command us to do? Uh, mom and dad or our grandmothers or our guardians asking us to take out the trash? Do we submit to that? Or just wait, like we talked about earlier uh, the other day about when people ask us to do stuff. If our teacher tells us to sit down, what do we do? Do we just submit to that? Because we are to submit to the authority as believers in Christ. That is part of being a believer in Christ, to submit to the authority. If the police pull us over, what do we do? When the police tells us, to, when the policeman or the police woman tells us to do something, we are to do it when they tell us. To. Whether we like that or not, keep your hands on the wheel, put your hands on the wheel, or put them on the dash. I need your license and registration. Don't ask what for, give it to them. Your parents ask you to do a task, yes, and do it with joy. I'll do it, I'll go, and do it. Not my will, that's what Jesus is telling us, but your will be done, Father. So when our parents ask us, it is God's will for us to obey our parents, it is God's will for us to obey God, and it's God's will for us to obey our, to obey our teachers. God has placed those authorities over us. He is the one who's placed them there. The president, the Congress, um, the, the police, the governor, the, the county council, uh, the county executive, the local mayor, the local town council, all these, the laws that God, if they're in, you know, we are to honor God by submitting to the authorities. I want us to think about this. I remind you of this and remind myself, of course, that even though disciples fell short by falling asleep here, as we often do when we get tired, over and over again, Jesus loved them and died for them. And despite their failing, he continued to work in their lives. And God will do the same for us. So let me ask you this. Uh, let's apply these truths, right? I have a $20 bill. As you can see, Jackson's on there. And so, how do we know? Because it says 20 on there. How do we know it's real? Because it has all the authenticating marks. It's got the line through it. It's got all the things listed on there. We can see the line through it right there. It says, and all the new marks on there and the faces that you see down below and in the corners and all that stuff. And um, I would like to say who wants this bill? Everybody would want my $20, but you can't have my $20. Here's a $20 bill. Is the value or the worth of this bill different? Is it the same? Will it spend the same way as it did before? This bill will not lose its value, and neither do we to God. He loves us and values us despite what we have or not done. We have much more worth in his eyes. The cross is proof of that. The cross is proof of that. Jesus would not have gone through his agonizing death if that were not the case. He did not love us and love the Father. He would not have gone through that to save us. And so I want you all to look up the verses on page 20 in our leader's guide, or I mean in our student guide, sorry. 
want to look at this again and think about our off-site punch list. Now, punch list, you may not know, but you will know. Maybe you've heard your parents say this when they bought a house or a townhouse or moved into an apartment. And a punch list is as you go through and walk through and look at the place and you tell the um, owner of the house before you buy it, I see nail holes, I see um, wallpaper falling off the wall. You go through and do a punch list and that way they'll fix those things. And so this is what I want you to do on page 20 is to lay the foundation, look up the following verses to uncover the truths about Jesus' gift of salvation. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, and 1 Peter 3, 18. And then build the framework with that at the bottom, these questions. And go through, what do these verses say about, my, uh, about what I am worth to Jesus? What do these verses teach me about me? Teach about me. And how should I use these verses or how should these verses change the way I live my life? How should I respond? I want to leave it there for the promise of worth. That we are worth much because of God who made us in his image, who came to die for us in our place, who suffered an agonizing death on the crucifixion on the cross in our place so that we might have forgiveness of our sins. So that through faith we can trust him and repent of our sins and agree with God that we are saved. Let's pray. Father, we look to you again. Thank you for the third foundation and laying of our building, for the foundation of work. Teach us, Lord, to love you and to honor you truly, to know that we are worth because of your love, because of you living in us. Let us be guided by that love, Lord. Change our lives and transform us. Let us give up the time needed, necessary off of Facebook and social media so that we may spend time along with you. We are thankful for your word today. Watch over us and guide us and lead us and help us to do our off-site punch list until we come back tomorrow for our fourth promise. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Thank you all for joining us again. And we'll see you soon for the foundation number four, which we are excited to get a hold of. We'll look for that next. Goodbye for now.